applause for John, I think. Oh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your attendance today and for sharing your valuable time with us. I hope you really enjoyed it and gained something out of the four presentations, the excellent presentations we had today. Uh, hope you, I hope we sort of told you everything you wanted to know about Tanzania, graphite geology, graphite processing, and black rock mining. And uh, I hope we told you everything that you, you need to know. But if you didn't, if you still don't have any, uh, if you still have some questions, we're going to do a Q&A in a minute. So uh, think of some, uh, some good questions for the team and we'll, we'll do our best to, to answer them. Um, but I'd like to uh, you know, thank in uh, the usual way our four speakers, Anna, Andrew, Daniel, and John, for, the, for their knowledge, sharing their knowledge with you, and for giving us their time and their commitment to put these presentations today together. So if you join me in, in thanking them in the usual way. So, uh, you know, I, I gained a lot out of the, the, the presentations myself. Um, Anna, a great, a great talk, very insightful, sharing uh, your, your knowledge from your time in Tanzania and your ongoing research with Dragoman. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I'm very optimistic about Tanzania. I've done a lot of investing and financing and building of projects in Africa, and Tanzania, to me, is, is very doable. I think, you know, once the current issues are, are resolved, which they will be, we will find Tanzania to be a great place to operate. And... I think the key for us is to, is to make sure that we engage with the locals, provide meaningful local content. Local content is key, um, and we are going to be very public in our investment, what we're doing in country, how much we're spending, who we're employing, wages, the uh, supplies that we purchase in country, and we'll be making it well known that we are a big contributor to the economic uh, advancement of, of Tanzania. So I think that'll be one thing we do. Um, the other thing is, um, well, I, I, I think <laughs> Andrew, in terms of uh, geology, I'm a geologist myself, I'll, I'll uh, commend him for bringing some rocks into uh, to a lunchtime presentation, but really commend him for showing some uh, polished photo, photo micrograph slides, because I think yeah, that for a lunchtime presentation is pretty heavy going, but really it does show you why our lump of rock in Tanzania at Mahengi is some of the best graphite in the world. So thank you, Andrew, for your, your insight as well. Um, Daniel, you're, uh, you're running our feasibility study and CPC engineering are doing a great job for us. So we're very happy to be second cab off the rank and gain the benefits of you know, the insights that, that CPC have gained from having gone through the study at Balama. And you know, I think that'll show uh, huge benefits for us in terms of optimization of our process flow sheet, optimization of our capital, and more importantly, or as important, I think, uh, in terms of us being able to execute on our ramp up. You know, a lot of projects disappoint on, on ramp up and being able to hit their nameplate through commissioning and being having the benefit of our pilot plant studies and all of the benefit of the historic work that has been done at Balama. I think that'll be a huge benefit for us in, in commissioning and ramp up. Finally, John, um, thank you for sharing a summary and update of, of BlackRock. Um, I think you can see John's energy and passion and knowledge and his clear focus. So uh, thank you for John. So again, thanks for all of our four speakers today for, for their time. So one more round of applause for them. So, so we, will, um, we will share with you this slide deck. So uh, for those who haven't got their names down with Simon, um, please, please make sure you do so and we'll share this slide deck with you. Thanks to Simon from NWR Communications for coordinating this event today and also for the Amora Hotel for putting on the venue and the food, a great lunch. So thanks very much for that. So guys and girls, over to you. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Sorry about that. Um, I think the trajectory in Tanzania is far more positive than Mozambique. I was just referencing the Kroll report on which uh, uncovered large levels of corruption in Mozambique right to the top echelons of government. 
I think the tra trajectory in Mozambique is not positive from this perspective, whereas in Tanzania it is. And again, one of the commonly used comparisons are the LNG projects, both in Mozambique and the planned LNG projects in Mozambique and Tanzania. And it's always been a bit of a race which one will go first. And I think this risk we're seeing that people are leaning towards Tanzania in this regard. I don't think there's going to be a big foot stamping in terms of a remarkable event. I think we've seen the big man politics play out. I reference the obviously Shell, Acacia, Dangote, the big events have happened. I think there will be a stabilisation, but there will also be a sort of stabilisation within the party in that although the CCM has always won each successive election since the introduction of multi-party politics, from memory they only won 54% of the vote last time. So I think there's going to be a stabilisation within the ranks in the lead up to 2020, but I see President Magafuli going forward as the candidate. Um, sorry, sorry. I think so long as it's, you know, it'll be a stabilisation period, there'll still be tweaking, but I don't think there's going to be a significant event between now and 2020. Okay, I'm a geologist, so I'll probably start with what's in the ground, which actually, as a general rule, controls the product that you're going to get out of it. So I don't know if that answers your question, but are you looking at how to evaluate or compare them? And it's the proportion of each that, are, that come out, I think. Some of them have a, lot, you know, a high proportion of very fine material that may be used for batteries, perhaps. One of the things we've done on, on Mahengi, which has actually been quite refreshing, is that every week when we have our test work um, updates with SGS in Canada, uh, the marketing guys are actually uh, dialing into that as well. <coughs> and so you're right, uh, graphite is uh, interesting in that there's so many different markets uh, and so many things you can target. And so what we've been doing basically is uh, looking at the results coming off of the, uh, the pilot plant and then the marketing guys are giving us guidance on what we should be targeting in terms of the design to then produce the uh, products that they can then go off and, and sell. Uh, and that's why you see we've got those different stages and those different grades because they're, they're, they're looking at the different markets and also the size fractions. Yeah. 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 So, so basically, uh, I mean, polishing is basically grinding, <coughs> where you're trying to break off the, that last of that gang material from the graphite flakes. Um, with graphite, some of it's strong, some of it can be quite weak. Um, so. Yeah, as you start adding more and more polishing or grinding, yeah, the risk is you can start breaking those flakes down. Um, which obviously, depending on what market you're going for, you don't necessarily want to do that to happen. Yeah, it depends on what market you're going for, yeah.
the the graphite market itself is changing. The traditionally graphite's been dominated by uh, a number of vertically integrated producers, Morgan's uh, typical, you know, and, and, and or Superior Graphite. Uh, for example, Superior Graphite produce over 600 different graphite products. Um, we're going to probably produce 12. So, 600 different graphite products, you're able to choose your price point and be very, very focused about your price point, but it's pretty difficult to gain economies of scale. Um, what we're doing and, and, and what's changing with the, the new generation of graphite mines is we're able to achieve significant economies of scale within certain product segments. And, and importantly, um, we're not trying to be everything to everyone. And I'll just go back to that, those three things you need to get right, focus, focus and focus. So we need to make sure that we're focused on delivering low costs. We're focused on selling our product into those sections of the market that will value it most. So value in use is very important and doing adequate value in use calibration is critically important. And that's where that battery cycle test um, and, and the expandability tests come in it because I can sit opposite a a battery spheronizer and say, I know my material yields 65% yield in spheronizing and I know the Chinese material you currently buy yields 30%. On that basis, why wouldn't you pay double the price of mine? Now, I don't mind leaving $20 on the table on to, to get the sale, but I'm not going to leave a $100 note. And to make sure I'm not leaving a $100 note, I need to do adequate work to, uh, to make sure I understand my value and use. Rule of thumb is you need one kilogram of spheronized product to produce one kilowatt hour of battery. Um, so if you're using Chinese flake, you need three kilograms of input material to produce one kilogram of uh, battery feed material. If you're using our stuff, you need two kilos. Mathematics is pretty simple. Here's got the value proposition there. Um, batteries are a significant growth area and will be a significant growth area. Uh, at the end of the day, our material is around one-third natural feed into a battery, uh, two-thirds into the expanded market. So for us, expanded is, is an area we need to focus on necessarily more. Uh, like I said, it is easy to turn big flake into little flake. You need a lot of temperature and quite a few million years to turn little flake into big flake. The comment I would make is, um, if I go back to uh, the Chinese battery conference, which was in, in November, the Chinese were of a view that they expect battery prices to halve in the next three years. And that's on the back of increased material availability. You know, lithium is obviously attracting a lot of attention, so I don't see lithium prices staying where they are for that much longer as we get more entrance into the market. Um, I would ditto expect the same out of nickel sulfates and cobalts as, as product comes in there and we're going to gain critical economies of scale in the manufacturing of batteries. So any new technology is going to come in but it geez, not only does it need to compete the current price point of lithium ion battery but it needs to compete that price point where the lithium ion battery will be in five years time. I said, 30% of our grading curve, because we have a material sizing curve, around one third of our product would naturally go into batteries. Um, we can turn the rest of it into battery feed, we just need to mill it a bit harder. Um, two thirds goes into the expanded market. And, and the battery feed market at the moment, somewhere between $850 to $1,000 a tonne, depending on your product. 
um, some of the expanded material really gets into some very interesting prices. You know, certainly north of uh, $2,000 a ton for some of the specialty expanded material. Now, the point at the end of the day is proof is going to be in an offtake contract with a dollar sign in front of it. But uh, if you don't have product to open up that conversation, it's pretty hard to have that conversation on a hypothetical basis. We're flaky. I wish there was a short answer to that question. In graphite, flakiness is good. Um, I, I guess two things. Firstly, in graphite, China has been the dominant supplier. Right? So I think a whole bunch of the industry has sort of said, oh, it's OK, the Chinese will fix it but not realising that the Chinese deposit types are going to have difficulty in scaling up any single mine to produce a monolithic, boring, consistent supply of material. Um, so the other thing, I, I also think a lot of the off-takers have made an assumption that the graphite mines will start up at a time when it's ready. And certainly the feedback we're getting now, the interest we're getting now, suggests that um, a few of the the more sophisticated players are having an oh my gosh moment and they're pretty keen to talk to us. So, you know, we're talking to the Japanese and the Koreans where 12 months ago we couldn't get them to answer the phone. Um, so the dialogue has changed and I think people are beginning to realise that uh, graphite's an important part of the equation. Importantly in graphite is the flake that is in the ground is the flake that ends up in the product. Lithium, cobalt and all these other precursor inputs go through a triple nine stage where essentially they become fungible. Graphite in the entire value chain is not fungible. Now the reliance on synthetic graphite has been because it is boringly consistent to an extent. Synthetic graphite is actually highly variable because it's a, it's a, a co-product of petroleum coke. So if you change the feedstock to an oil refinery, you change the synthetic graphite properties significantly. Now, They've been able to say, look, we, we'll get this stuff off an oil refinery, but the big, you know, the 900-pound gorilla in the graphite supply chain is what happens if the oil refining industry becomes um, uneconomic because of the pullback on, on fuel demand? And that's really going to push people back into graphite very, very quickly. And it's actually a heck of a challenge because, you know, the big one in, in synthetic graphite is electrodes. You know, that's a, a million and a half tonne market on its own. Uh, at the moment, that's no natural flight gets near it. Yeah, 
Well, we put our, you know, we put our head on the block there by saying I'm going to deliver a mining licence before we start construction. I don't understand how I could even you know, effectively close off a debt instrument to fund a construction without a mining licence. So, you know, where we are now, I have five months to get a mining licence or, or, or seven months to get a mining licence. I'm pretty confident we're going to get it. The window's opened. Um, as, as Anna pointed out, the arm waving and the foot stomping stopped. Um, there's a bit of an oh my god moment, what have I done going on in Tans near? Because, you know, everybody did take their bat and ball and go home. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, Tanzanians still want mobile phones, cars and all these things that you need to pay for with foreign exchange. They need to do something to earn that foreign exchange. Um, so, you know, th they've woken up to it um, and I think they've, they're pretty keen to welcome foreign investment back, subject to that foreign investment being uh, a lot more ethically driven than some of the behaviours we've seen in the past. And, and the big point for us, and that's why the, the Tazara exercise was so important, is it demonstrates our intent to the government to work with local infrastructure to actually create jobs in Tanzania and to use the facilities and services that are available. And the same conversation with Tanesco. Again, it's economic integration. And if you think about, you know, how do you manage political risk in an environment such as Africa or some other places in Latin America, economic integration and surrounding yourself with friends is the most effective political risk management you can get. And, and that's, that's the fundamental of what we're trying to do in terms of setting up our business. We are now, yeah. It, it, uh, it's, as Anna said, the, the window was closed and they didn't answer phone calls for about six months. Uh, the window officially opened about a week ago for, for mining licences. We got our EIS in uh, about six weeks ago. It's been reviewed. We've uh, had to modify it and it's going in for its final review now. Fifteenth of June, because they've got a thirty-day response. It's legislated. They have so far. Uh, remember, John Magafuli has got a pretty short fuse, um, so uh, you know the gun's been well used. So I think people are pretty concerned about turning it around on time. Thank you well. I know we've fed you well. I hope we've entertained you. I hope we've educated you. So thanks very much again for your time.